We've got Celia who's six, and we've got B who is four. I'm going to give you a marshmallow. If you want, you can eat this straight away, or you can wait for a bit until I come back into the room and you'll get a second marshmallow. Okay? I'll leave it up to you. I'm going to leave the room for a bit. Bye-bye. Okay, girls, how did you do? You haven't eaten yours. <laughs> and what happened to yours, B? Where is it? Yes. What, it's there in your tummy? Is it? So you couldn't wait for another one. So you, as a reward, get another marshmallow. What do you think of that? Great. Tasty. Okay, so those of you that may or may not have seen the video a bit like that before, it's an experiment that was done in the 1950s, and it was done to show that some people are wired to cope with sort of deferred gratification, and some people aren't. And what they did in the 1950s, and that's a modern equivalent of it, was they went then to revisit those children later in their lives, and those that were good at deferred gratification, so the girl on, a, on, a, on your right here, um, went on to have actually much more sort of in, impressive or successful professional careers. So it's just a, an idea that I want you to sort of think about while we go through um, the sort of presentation we've got today. So I've called it Marshmallow Investing and there are our two stars. Um, so what I want to do today is try and sort of take you through a few things. I want to take you through um, two bad errors of admission I made in my um, last six years of running money. Um, these are two companies that I really, really should have bought shares in. Um, and I want to take you through what I learned from that. I then want to give you an example of a company that looks very similar to them today. I want to give you some other ideas as well. And I'm going to show you about 60% of my current portfolio. And you can ask questions on those as you wish. So the two companies, as you can see, are Dr. Pepper, Snapple, and Moody's. Um, I won't go through each of these in detail because it's more interesting for you to know what I think about the future than what I think about the past. But it's worth just spending a minute here. I mean, we did, and I did, it's my fault, not anyone else's fault, I did an inordinate amount of work on these two companies seven, six, seven, eight years ago. Um, you can see that they've both got brands, they've both got moats, they've both got market shares, and everyone will have their own different opinion of them. But from, in terms of what we look for in businesses, they have a lot of what we look for. So we look for high return on tangible capital. We look for businesses that operate in a good industry. We look for those that have a demonstrable moat of scale, market share, brand, something of that nature. Um, we look for businesses that can grow, but that can grow with low cost. And we look for businesses that allocate capital well. Well, both of those companies, not just judged today, but you looked at dispassionately six years ago. And I got out my old notes before I started this job. Um, sort of six or seven weeks ago, in my old notes, it basically articulated all of those points. Okay? So, excuse me. So how did we miss them? How on earth, bearing in mind we write about this sort of thing, we articulate this sort of thing in our investment letters and on our website, how did we miss these companies when they demonstrated all the traits that we sought? Well, the first is that we were dumb. 
possibly. Um, but if you're writing something and saying that this is what I think you should look for, you're articulating it. You're understanding it well enough to think through it. So how did you miss it in practice if you saw it in theory? Well, the other possibility, I think, is that we were just busy fools. And I think there's a lot of truth in that. So even now, I like looking at lots of new stocks, lots of new ideas. And six, seven, eight years ago, I was looking at all sorts of different ways to run money. I was looking at deep value. I was trying to look at compounding more. I was even, for my sins, looking at risk arb, knowing that Buffett had done a successful um, career out of running that early in his life. So I was looking at lots of different strategies and lots of different companies. Um, the other possibility, of course, is that we were just sort of tempted, if you want to call it, by the metaphorical marshmallow of the day. So we were tempted by low PE stocks, by special situations, by management turnarounds. And if you say, I buy value and I buy special situations, you can sort of almost find any reason to own a company that isn't a high price momentum stock. But it's a bit different if you're being a little bit more prescriptive and saying, these are the financial traits and operational traits um, that I'm looking for. So I'm not saying you shouldn't buy cheap companies and you shouldn't buy turnarounds and special situations. We do as well occasionally. But I think looked at in hindsight, we missed, or I missed, two, what I would call, two-foot fences. So let's just look at what the cost of this has been. So Dr. Pepper has had an IRR of 22% in the six years that I didn't own these shares. Um, the key point here, I think, for me, having revisited this personally, is that all the traits on the left-hand side are traits that we identified six years ago. So we knew that Dr. Pepper wasn't going to have terribly good growth. It's one of the points in our notes. We thought about a 2% growth rate per annum in terms of um, growth rate because it was a, um, a US-centric business was likely. We didn't think the EBIT margin would rise, and it has risen from sort of 18 to 21%, and that's why the EBIT's up more than the revenues. But we did know the share count was going to go down because they'd always bought their shares back, we're articulating that. We did know the dividends were going to be paid pretty much in line with the past. Doesn't say it on there, but it's a negative working capital business, so the cost of growth is very low. Um, one point I'm sure many of you will have already noticed before I get that far down the chart is that obviously a large component of the 224% return is 117% that came from the PEB rating. Now, I could quite easily strip that out and say, well, how am I to know that the stock market is going to change its mind and the, you know, the total return I would have made in this share without the PEB rating was 107%. Well, my fund's up sort of 85 or so, so it's not so far away in that six-year period of time. So I didn't miss much, did I, really? Well, I think that's a little bit selective. At this point in time, or in 2000, and, um, so I should just say that this was all judged on the six years, 11 to 2017, even though we've shown the charts going back further. But in those six years, the starting P in 2011 um, was 14 times. Now, if I give you a business that I think is going to compound and give you all the traits of compounding that says it's going to compound at 13% intrinsic value, well, I think you're going to say to me, I'm happy to pay more than 14 times earnings for it. So it wasn't beyond the wit of man or the wit of me to work out the fact that the starting P of 14 times gave me a margin of safety, and maybe it should have ended up on 16 times or 18 times or 19 times. It ended up on 22 times, and that's why we've got the PEB rating we've got. And that's why we've got the total return we've got. Um, let's just look at Moody's quickly. This is an even more painful chart. Um, and the reason why this is more painful is because I did a lot, lot more work on Moody's. And we concluded at the time that Moody's would grow its revenues at more like 6 or 7% per annum. It was coming off a cyclical trough. Um, historically, the credit age rating agencies have had revenue growth that has been two to three times GDP, and we thought that was going to be replicated again. As you can see, there wasn't really any um, change in the operating margin. There wasn't a lot of operational gearing, so the net income line grew not much more than revenues. But we knew the share count was going to go down because it was bought their stock back. We knew they'd pay the dividend. So before we come on to the PUE rating one in here, the point to say here is that um, at this point in time, if we just cut off there, so there was no PE re-rating. You'd have made 160% in six years owning Moody's. That's 18% per annum with no PE re-rating. 
So that means that that's what you'd have made if Moody's today was still on 16 times earnings. If I offered you a share today on 16 times earnings with Moody's characteristics, and I said, it's pretty easy to forecast this business. It isn't going to use any leverage. We think we're going to have an intrinsic value growth of 18% per annum. How much do you want to pay for the stock? If I offered it to you at 16 times earnings, I think you'd all rip my arm off. Maybe if I offered it to you at 17 or 18 or 19 times earnings. The same point is true as we made in Dr. Pepper Snapple. That level of PE starting point was a low level for a business of this quality. Now, don't get me wrong, I'm interested in buying great companies for buying them at great prices. I'm not buying either of these shares at these points in time because there isn't a great margin of safety that comes with a 22 times earnings or a 30 times earnings starting PE. The point is to look for companies with these types of characteristics to get the compounding of intrinsic value, but also get the right side of Mr. Market and the margin of safety you get owning great, great quality companies, as Munger would say, at fair prices. So what have we learned from all of this? Well, we've learned that knowing what to look for is really important, but in truth, you know, our investment approach hasn't changed that much. If you go on our website, the, the language on the website has changed very little in the sort of six or seven years that it's been on there. The key, key point is temperament. And it's having the temperament to stop and carefully reflect um, on what the sort of powerful compounding forces are and when they all come together. And I think this is the key point, is that earlier on I mentioned a number of factors that we look for. So growth at low cost, allocation of capital, high return on tangible capital. Um, and it is not in individually each one of those that is so powerful. It is the combination of those forces. As Munger calls it, the lollapalooza. And when you see those forces combine, that's when I need to spend more time saying, OK, lose the noise that's on my desk and focus on these businesses. Because ultimately, they can be, as I said earlier on, the sort of two-foot fences that we can be missing. So before I come on to an example today that I think is similar and you should look at and be spending more time on than maybe you, you might be, um, I thought I'd just give you some other examples of some holdings that we own. Um, what I'm giving you here is about 60% of the portfolio we've got in our fund today. I'm really happy to take questions on any one of these companies within reason. Um, and Simon did a great job for me. Where is Simon? He's out there somewhere. But he did a great job yesterday. Um, in terms of taking you through the uh, attractions of Sports Direct and Ryanair. So we can take questions on those, but to be honest with you, he did such a great job, I wouldn't, I wouldn't change a word. Um, I'll be honest, if I was picking a stock for Christian's stock picking competition for the next year or two, I'd pick Sports Direct or I'd pick um, Wells Fargo. And if you want to talk about either of those, we can do that in the Q&A. Um, but let's look at an example of perhaps how the sort of marshmallow investing for gratification could be thought about today. So of the two girls we saw earlier on, the one that was closest to me was called Celia. She was very restrained and waited for her second marshmallow. And we sort of just take the idea that maybe Celia might just consider Walt Disney today. Um, now for the low P stocks and the deep value ideas people have come up with today or, or yesterday, Disney would be one of the higher P multiples at 14 and a half times starting earnings. But the point here is, is that it has a lot of the traits that we highlighted in the companies that we wished we'd bought. So let's look at the companies that, let's learn from those mistakes and try to not make those mistakes again. So Disney has a 35% return on tangible capital. It has a phenomenal global content and moat around the business. It has excellent historic, historic growth. It's compounded EBITs at 13% per annum since 2003, compounded. The chart on the right, I think, is quite interesting because obviously they made the odd acquisition of late um, and those acquisitions effectively can dilute your share issue if you have to issue significant shares to do so. But revenue per share at Disney is up three times, three times in 17 years. But this is a mature business, we think. This is a long, long way from Mickey Mouse and Warren Buffett buying the shares you know, 20 or 30 years ago. Um, in short, it passes the test that we look for in businesses. We have sort of two rules of three, if you like. We look for businesses that tick the boxes of operate, generate, and allocate. 
So are they great operators in their field in comparison to their peers, winning share, share of mind, and so on? Are they great generators of returns? And are they great allocators of the cash that comes up from those returns? Disney ticks all three of those boxes. The other three things we look for are great companies run by great managers at great prices. And again, we can debate the price issue on Disney, but it's not an outrageous price to pay. And it does tick a lot of those parameters we saw in the early companies. So let's just look at Disney in a bit more detail. Um, we call Disney the sort of content king, and I could make the argument that the content king is just about to possibly marry the content queen, or Jack, if you want to push it that way, um, in terms of its proposed merger with Fox. Now, there was a period of time many, many years ago where Disney was all things powerful in content. It was the major market leader in animation. And then it slightly lost its way, and a lot of the good quality animation was being made outside Disney. So Pixar, Marvel, Star Wars, were all happening outside Disney. But what Disney did was basically go and buy those businesses. Now, the reason I didn't look at Disney six, seven years ago is I took one look at the price they paid for DreamWorks and went, 30 times earnings, I'm not interested in a business that spends money at 30 times earnings. But if you go back and look at the acquisitions they made, they were extremely affordable from their regular cash flows in terms of they were small percentages of annual cash flows. And also, they made great returns on the invested capital on the total money they spent, not just the tangible assets they bought, but on the total price they spent for those assets. And as a consequence, we are back to Disney dominating media content, animation content globally in the films that it produces. During the six-year period um, that we've used for the other companies, Disney also has had a very high internal investment rate its CapEx depreciation has been two times, invested in many parts of the business, particularly built a brand new park in Shanghai. But despite all of this money being spent, Disney's still managed to find the cash to cancel 14% of its shares in those six years, which is something that I think is reminiscent of the companies we saw earlier on. But Mr. Market's obviously worried, and we all know, or some of us that know Disney will know why Mr. Market's worried. He's worried about ESPN, and he's worried about an out-of-the-blue Fox acquisition. So the ESPN situation, I think, is particularly interesting because it's judged today as a snapshot in time. ESPN is seen to be overpaying for content and then being a victim of cable cutting. So it's getting squeezed between two sort of powerful forces, if you like. And it's judged on that basis alone. ESPN doesn't look a terribly attractive investment or attractive asset. But there is still a phenomenal global market for sports rights and sports content that people want to watch them. They just don't want to watch them on cable. So the way to think about this, we think, is to look at well, what value today accrues to Disney from ESPN. Out of a rough $80, $90 cable um, monthly bundle in the States, about $8 comes to Disney for its ESPN rights effectively, which is actually a very small amount of money Bearing in mind that the sports rights is the main reason why people want cable in the first place. So you could easily put a scenario together that says there's a different distribution mechanism where half the number of cable subscribers take ESPN, but they pay twice the price because they're genuine sports fans. But that just doesn't happen to be what doesn't happen to be the way the industry is structured today. Um, in the Fox acquisition. Uh, <laughs> There's a lot going on at Disney in terms of its move to an over-the-top offering of all of its effectively content. And it's been doing a lot in terms of taking over businesses like Bantech, talking about its own platforms. But the Fox acquisition is a huge step and change step in that. So it is a surprising deal. It is a very big deal in the context of um, Disney. We could talk about the metrics. It's an all-stock deal. But what we think can be created here is a sort of head and shoulders above the rest of the industry content business that has, very importantly, enough content and enough power to draw customers to it that will want to subscribe to the new offering that they create in an over-the-top world. Um, we think at the end of that, you can end up with the same characteristics you've started on the previous slide, i.e. high returns on tangible capital, great brands, great innovation, great cash flow generation. It just might not look like that for a year or two during the transition period. It is also quite conceivable that on the other side of that 
trough period, if you like, investment period, Disney will be looked at very differently by Mr. Market. And you might think about Disney as being a rare global content, high return on capital business, a rare bird. And he just might pay a lot more than 14 and a half times earnings for it. Now we may be coming, or I may be coming across as a little bit overconfident about this transition to over the top from Disney. So why am I so confident that this could happen? Well, we've seen this movie before. So this is a business that I'm pleased to say we didn't miss. Um, we brought about 5% of our fund in um, WWE at about $12, um, sort of June, October 14, that sort of period. Um, it's about 3% of our fund today, and it's now $37. WWE, for those of you that don't know, is a wrestling um, media business. It's acting, effectively, but it's very, very popular with those that like wrestling. Um, the key point here is, is that the story of WWE is a story of an extremely brave founder. So Vince Mahon basically had run WWE for many years. He's still the 60% owner of the shares. But in the middle of 2014, with the shares at an all-time high, um, he basically said, we are going to take our pay-per-view subscriptions for our premium events off of cable and put them on our own network. Okay, it'll be called the WWE Network, and we're going to build it from scratch. He said three things. He said, I don't know how long it's going to take, I don't know how much it's going to cost, and I don't know how much money we'll make when we get there. But I think it's the right thing to do. Well, you can see what happened to the share price as a result. It went from $30 to $12, and it stayed there for quite a long period of time. What's happened today in WWE is that network is getting traction. That network has got enough subscribers. And it is at a point of proving its worth and proving the fact that it was the right thing to do. And WWE is now waiting for a renewal of its TV subscription rights in addition to having um, the pay-per-view um, access directly via the network that they've got. But this created huge investor uncertainty in the same way that I think the Disney transition will create and is creating uncertainty. As Munger says at the bottom here, you know, the great lesson in microeconomics is to discriminate between when technology is going to kill you and when it's going to help you. Uh, and I would remind you that the disruption that's taking place in the media sector today is disruption of distribution. It isn't disruption of content. There are still great content brands that are very much in demand, that customers love buying and love watching on many different distribution platforms. Our bet is that Disney and Fox, like WWE, or in truth, or Disney, Fox and Sky, or Disney without Fox and Sky, have enough brands and have enough content to draw a significant number of subscribers to a new platform. When they do, we think you could create a business with potentially excellent economics. So in summary, I would say this. I would say that knowledgeable investors understand high returns, moats, and compounding well. Telling you about those features is really not something new for you. But it can be hard to have the temperament to use this knowledge in practice, with the starting value discipline, and when other temptations beckon. We resolve today to sort of maybe resist today's sort of value marshmallows a little bit more often, and try and hold out for those great compounding opportunities. And as Munger says, sort of get the stuff, the average ideas off the desk so you can focus on the really good quality ones. Mental models help us a bit too. So rather than just saying now that we buy compounders and deep value, we talk about having rare birds, so Formula One, Disney, WWE, mispriced compounders, Ryanair, Sports Direct, and capital cycle plays, shipping, um, banking if you like. I, I finish most of the presentations I do with this slide because I just sort of feel it encapsulates lots and lots and lots of words that everyone gives at conferences. At the end of the day, what we're trying to do is find great companies and find them when they're priced like bad companies. That really is our job. Um, Charlie Munger said something new recently which I really enjoyed and I've used it a few times now, is that where there's mystery, there is margin. And I think that's absolutely right, Charlie. Thank you very much for your time. Delighted to take your questions. Thank you. A any questions for you? Easy. Well, well uh, thank you for the presentation. You
you've mentioned Wells Fargo also. You, what, you, what is your thesis about it to, from here to come? Thank you. I'd like to admit that this was not a stage question, but I'm really <laughs> pleased you asked it. Because I originally was going to present on Wells Fargo, and then when I saw the mistakes I'd made in these stocks and I did the work a few weeks ago, I thought, what the hell, I'll share that instead. But Wells wasn't a good example of these. Um, Wells, I think, is a really interesting example of a business that everybody loved and fated not very long ago that everybody now thinks there's something terribly wrong with. For those of you that have got different systems, Bloomberg, FactSet, whatever, go and look at the long-term ROA of Wells Fargo and the long-term ROA of companies like JP Morgan. And go and look at the long-term ROE of the two companies. These are businesses that, weren't, that were forced to take capital in the credit crisis but didn't need it. So these are businesses whose returns pre the crisis were arguably sustainable because they had a sustainable capital structure. Wells's ROAs pre the crisis were sort of 1.8%, 1.75%, phenomenal returns on assets. Most banks are lucky if they can make 1%. As a consequence of that, Wells's ROE was sort of 18, 19, 20% on a sort of roughly 10 times gearing multiple. Okay? The reason why it could make those premium ROAs was because it sells a lot of products to individual to one person and because it has a phenomenal funding cost advantage because it's got such a fantastic network of depositors. Um, that is something that hasn't gone away just because Wells Fargo has had a sort of crisis of confidence, if you like. And I've you know, spent a lot of time, I've owned Wells for a long time. Uh, the conference calls, the banking conference calls at the back end of last year were really, really interesting. Because the JP Morgan conference calls, and we own JP Morgan as well, was all about, um, we've just done brilliantly everything. We've paid a massive dividend, we're growing loan book here, we're growing our deposit base here, we're cross-selling these products. It's all about how fantastic JP Morgan is doing. But JP Morgan's ROEs have never been better than they are today or going to be next year. So Jamie Diamond is giving you at the Investor Day recently a, a new range of ROEs that takes you to sort of 17, 18%, purely because the tax rate's gone up from the previous target of 15. But that implies that, well, JP Morgan is going to be making premium returns, quite significantly premium returns, so those expected by Wells Fargo. I just think that's a nonsense. The reason why that's the case is because Wells Fargo's cost base is hugely inflated. It's at a 66% cost income ratio right now. Well, our peers in the US industry at 54. If Wells gets to a sort of 59% cost income ratio, which is its guidance for 2018, let alone after that, then Wells will get to a return on tangible capital of sort of 17, maybe even 18% after that, in which case we think Wells Fargo is a $100 stock and you get the dividends in the meantime. So delighted to share some more detail with you, but thank you. Anybody else? If it helps you, I can put okay. those up. No? Okay. Thank you very much, right. Andrew.